Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Tampa, Florida, where we're covering the National Defense Industrial Association's annual SOFIC Conference and Trade Show, one of the world's largest gatherings of special operators and the industries that serve them. Our coverage here is sponsored by FLIR Systems, and we're over here at the UK Pavilion to talk to Andrew Sheldon, uh, a man who's had uh, more than 25 years experience in, uh, in uh, digital for, uh, forensics. Uh, you're now uh, with uh, Evidence Talks. You're the Chief Technology uh, Officer uh, there a company founded in 2002 to uh, extract uh, and to conduct digital forensics on um, uh, all manner of electronic media that's seized in the in the hundreds if not the tens of thousands now of raids uh, I said hundreds that's that's a misnomer tens of thousands of raids uh, on um, uh, terror uh, cells uh, around the world um, talk to us a little bit about about the technology. Um, you guys are under contract with uh, U.S. Special Operations Forces uh, to do this sort of thing in a real world basis, and your your product here is something that 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 automates the digital analysis. Talk to us a little bit about the evolution of the field, the evolution of the company, and what you guys are showcasing here today. Sure, thanks. So we started as a digital forensic services company. So we're providing services for law enforcement in the UK way back in the days before the forensic tools were available. And over that period of time, my experience and the experience of my team has led us to develop new software techniques. And one of those is triage. So we started working with US Special Forces back in 2004. Uh, doing training on digital media exploitation to try and get the times of acquisition down and the speed of analysis up. So in that world of sensitive site exploitation and indeed in, in uh, civil cases, in child exploitation cases, time is critical. But as devices have grown, the number of devices have grown, the capacity of the, those devices has grown, it takes longer and longer to get to the data you're interested in. So what we did was change the way people thought about that. And we developed a triage technique, which is very, very fast indeed. And in fact, just recently, we've developed a, a forensic imaging technique, which allows officers and first line responders, uh, the, the SOFIC type or SOCOM type uh, forces, to acquire data in the field in minutes, seconds or minutes, whereas before it would take hours. So as an example, um, a MacBook Air would take normally about 45 minutes for 128 gig. We do it in three minutes. So radically changing the way we collect data. But there's two things. Collecting the data is one aspect. Being able to look at the data quickly and get that actionable intelligence quickly is critical in fast moving, very kinetic uh, environments. So what we've done is made the analysis of it really simple. So you don't have to be an expert anymore. Uh, our tool, Spectre, runs in the background and just analyzes all the data. So if you've got, for example, a micro dot embedded in a Word document with a, an invisible um, uh, watermark uh, and it's attached to an email or it's perhaps in a zip file or embedded in a PDF, Spectre just extracts all that and shows you a box with all the pictures in. So it's very easy for the operators with very little technical skill to be able to collect and analyze that data. Um, so fundamentally what we try and do is speed up the acquisition process, speed up and automate the analysis process and put it in the hands of people who matter, people whose uh, job is to protect each other on an SSE raid. Uh, they want to get that data quickly to move on to the next operation. Uh, digital security is something that's a major issue. Um, all the major telephone providers have been working very, very hard to do that end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, it's because folks demand it. Uh, that's raise some challenges with the national security community uh, that wants access to these systems. Unfortunately, the access to those systems are also a vulnerability that others exploit. Um, talk to us about the new levels of security that are going on electronic devices and how they are impeding you. Is that a limiting factor at all in the exploitation of this equipment if the bad guy isn't operating on an older generation system but is using, for example, an iPhone 10? Okay, so uh, cell phones and, and handsets are a slightly separate subject. We deal mostly with computer media and computer uh, storage systems. However, if there is an iPhone backup on a computer or, or a thumb drive that we've touched, then we extract the data from that. In terms of encryption, it can be challenging. Um, but we work in another area, which I can't talk too much about, where we've been very successful in, for example, getting into Apple FireVault systems. Uh, we have a service that we provide that does that. So if you, I, I travel with an Apple because it was the best encryption available. Firevault 2 is absolutely brilliant. Uh, I found a way into it. So we now provide that service to government customers. Uh, the uh, challenges that we find out in the field 
Um, where you've got a disk that's encrypted, we can still image it. So we can get that data, pull it off site very quickly, and then we can attack it with other tools on much larger scale systems. We have systems that will allow us to grab data that we need from running uh, Windows systems, for example, and we need that data in order to be able to unlock the systems. So things that I can't talk too much in the open about, but there are capabilities. And with, with Spectre, with the triage tool, it has the ability to uh, unlock or decrypt uh, files that it finds, things like Word documents and Office documents. If they're password protected, we can crack those on uh, as part of the analysis process. So generally, the advance of um, encrypted systems and encryption in general has made it much harder to get to the data fast. But there are new techniques that come down the line to tackle that those uh, protection mechanisms. I'm all for, for uh, privacy, I'm all for civil liberties. Unfortunately, the bad guys are using what we would use to protect ourselves, they're using it as well. And we need to find ways into that. So give us a rundown because your new product is the Spectre Ultra uh, and Spectre with a K, S-P-E-K-T-O-R, not Spectre like uh, James Bond. Uh, so the Spectre is the main, uh, the, the legacy system, if you will, yep. and now the Ultra is, is the new one. Talk to us about the differences between the two. Okay, so Spectre is the core capability. It'll do triage and imaging, basically everything a forensic analyst needs to do in the field. And it comes as a full kit. So the Spectre main kit is uh, SOCOM use it in big numbers. Uh, it's a rugged laptop with all the peripherals, all the accessories you need in a carry case. Uh, you can also get it as a small, uh, peli a small tactical pouch, which is actually just a thumb drive. Uh, and you can plug that into your existing computer, boot from that, and it gives you the same capability, but it's a tactical capability. And then the new product, Spectre Ultra, is designed for rapid acquisition of multiple devices simultaneously. So it's a very lightweight tablet, uh, it's got multiple ports on it, and you can plug three or four USB devices into it simultaneously and do use our rapid imager technology to acquire those at dramatic speeds. So you've got the big systems for the, uh, for the back end, the EAC can use our Cascade system, which is Spectre on steroids, it's a scalable cloud solution. You've got Spectre, the rugged system, which is for the frontline forces that need to mobilize fairly quickly. And then you've got Spectre Ultra for the SSE kind of capabilities, which are really at the sharp end, where time is critical. And SSE stands for? Sensitive Site Exploitation. MedX, it, it's got lots of different names, DocX, MedX. I, I just wanted to make sure that for those of us, uh, those in our audience who didn't exactly know what SSE was, that uh, they got it straight from the horse's mouth. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> with the clarification. So if we go to the pictures, everything's categorized here, so I can just say, okay, sort by size. It's just so easy. So here's a picture of a gun, and this gun was taken with a Canon camera, so now I can search for Canon up here, and immediately I am just shown the 24 pictures that came from a Canon camera. Alternatively, I can say, show me all the pictures that came from all the cameras. So if I say camera model, here's all the pictures, here's the ones from the apples. If I apply that, now I've got all the pictures from the Apple camera, including a big pile of cache, and this one came from this geographic location as well. So everything's searchable, every, everything's uh, retrievable uh, from this. And then we move from this, uh, which is the full kit, to the new product. So this is Spectre uh, Ultra. Uh, this is a lightweight tablet, it runs the full Spectre product, but its focus is on acquisition quickly at the point of contact. So if I go into Ultra, all I need to do is plug in devices. Sorry, <laughs> turn it around the other way. So I plug in the devices I want to capture from, and they start imaging automatically. I can do three or four at a time. It's difficult to do without covering up the screen. So there you go. While we're talking, I'll just let these image. The beauty of this is that they image really, really fast. So you get the speed here, about 200 meg uh, uh, a second. Uh, this is a 64 gig drive, that's a 32 gig drive, this is an eight gig drive, they're all running at different speeds. But I can, the beauty of this is from an SSE perspective, if time's up, if I have to exfat, uh, exfiltrate, I can just pull these out and go, and I've got the data up to that point. So I can run multiple collections simultaneously, absolutely unique. And then the same tablet runs the Spectre software as well. So if I want to analyze the data I've collected and perform keyword searches across it in multiple languages, I can run any number of keyword lists, including the Arabic. I have a, 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 a hit here. And if I go into here, you can see I can view the Arabic document. Oops. 
I can view the Arabic document that I've uh, identified. I can uh, reset that search. I can look for Bitcoin activity, uh, Bitcoin addresses. Uh, there's one in a Twitter tweet here, I think, somewhere. So if I view that, you can see this is a tweet that's got a Bitcoin address in. Um, very easy analysis and a collection, again, really fast. So this was 34,000 files collected in about 1 minute 52 seconds uh, from a thumb drive. But this will also do computers. You just have to have the collector. You configure the collector to go and collect the data, plug this collector into a computer, and it will extract the data and store it securely. And then the analysis suite will do the rest. So, and it's from a forensic perspective, it's quite uh, useful. So if I uh, clear that for a moment, and I say, OK, I want to see all the pictures. So there's 19,000 pictures. And I want to see all the pictures that have come from email. So I just say, show me the pictures that have come from email. Pretty quickly it comes up. So let's have a look at this one. And I want to see the e email that this came from. So I just click this. And you can see it's all touch, uh, touch, uh, finger touch. There's the email. And if I go into here, you can read the message. So everything's linked. It makes it really easy for soldiers, for operators, uh, to analyze the data they've collected at the FOB and then they can bring it back to the EAC and do a much wider analysis and link it using our breathing intelligence capability into their intelligence systems. And, and as we've been talking here, we've already got one of the drives is done, which I imagine yep. is the 8 gig one. Uh, that's the 8 gig one, yeah, so let's uh, pull that one out. These two are running now, so I can just drop that 8 gig. So we've got a 64 gig and a 32 gig still running here. Uh, still running pretty quickly. Uh, we can do different things. This is running a bit low on, on power, but um, we, we can do different uh, speeds with different, uh, different thumb drives. We can also do, collect just the allocated space as well. So it's a pretty quick system, about as fast as you can go. What about data recovery? I mean, uh, there can't be uh, a bad guy who thinks it's a good idea for his computer to be captured. So destroying that in some manner is, is uh, something which is a standard feature, whether you're talking about criminals or whether you're, you're, you're talking to, to bad guys, however you want to define them. Um, what are some techniques and tools you guys have developed to be able to recover some of that data off of media that may have been deliberately, um, you know, either, either very, very badly damaged or sought to be destroyed? So there's two levels, really. There's stuff, there's what's called a logical recovery, where the disk is spinning, perhaps, or the solid state drive is available, but the data's been deleted. That's something that we do as, as general process, as part of the forensic process. It's not stuff that can be generally automated to the nth degree, but we do a fair amount of it automatically. The next level is physical recovery, where you've got a drive that's been run over or thrown in the river or something like that. And our, our team back in the UK have been doing this for years. We've got some of the best people in the business. They're able to recover data. We did a job against a paedophile who ripped his disc out, threw it out of a sixth floor window. It hit the road, was run over by a truck and bounced into a canal. We recovered it and got 86,000 indecent images off it. So we can do recovery from very heavily damaged drives. But of course, it all depends on the level of damage. And the tools that are used are tools that are used by experts. They're not stuff that you can give in the hands of uh, the first responders, for example. It's about speed. It takes a long time to recover that kind of data. But if it's spinning or if it's available to be read, we can image it, and then we always work off the image. So sometimes we only get one chance to read those sectors on a disk. But when you read them, you actually uh, you can't go back and reread them. So we have to be very careful about how we do that. And so having a clean room, being able to spin the platters off outside the disk and read them, something we can do. And uh, one, one last question, uh, the big debate about whether or not it's actually possible to delete anything in cyberspace. Is it possible to actually delete something or is there always a shadow of that that exists somewhere that you can exploit? Said one of the world's leading experts. <laughs> I'm asking one of the world's leading experts on this. So I've, I've been eager to get an answer to the question. All right, so my advice is always, if, you're gonna, if you've got a hard disk and it's a spinny hard disk, my advice is always physical destruction. So uh, take it out, you can get things called macerators which will grind it up into dust. You can't get data off dust, okay? But if you're running solid state drives, uh, like thumb drives for example, they will always have a remnant of data. They use a very complicated technique called wear leveling. It means that when the data's gone, it might not have gone and it can be recovered. And we've done recoveries from thumb drives and now that the advent of solid state drives, SSDs in computers, you never can delete all the data because the disk itself is organizing its own structure. And it'll say, that cell's become a little bit 
corrupt or it's not responding properly, I'll move the data to a different cell, and, but I, I won't delete the original. You just will never be able to see it again unless you know how to. So solid state drives, I would say always physical destruction. Even if you're going to give them to charity, you want to give them to charity, don't. You can just physically destruct them. A uh, bit of C4 always works in the military environment. That's <laughs> the best way. So uh, yeah, the, the short answer is it is possible to delete it, uh, but it's not possible to delete it securely. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's good that you gave me that uh, bit of advice, although what I was looking at from the standpoint of as somebody who occasionally loses a file or it gets deleted by accident, uh, my, one of my kids uh, deleted something uh, that they were working on, so I was asking whether it, that's actually recoverable, but I think embedded in your answer is the fact that uh, unless you've gone to extreme lengths to destroy it, it's probably still alive somewhere. Uh, that's correct. It, 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 for your, for your uh, child's uh, example, it's probably recoverable. The most important thing is when you know it's gone, don't power on the disk. Don't download stuff from the internet onto the disk that you're trying to recover the data from because that action will overwrite potentially the data that you've recovered. So as soon as you know it's gone, don't touch that disk. Use another computer to download some recovery stuff. I'll give you a free tip. If it's um, if it's a thumb drive you've lost or a memory card from a camera, there's a brilliant little tool, it's free, called Recover, R-E-C-U-V-A. Only use it for memory cards and, and thumb drives, but it will do a pretty good job of recovery if you've just deleted the files. Andrew uh, Sheldon, uh, Chief Technology Officer at Evidence Talks. Thanks very much. One of the most illustrative talks I've had in a while <laughs> and uh, certainly uh, applicable uh, at home. Sir, okay. thanks very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Great to see you.